<clears throat> Chair Berlai. Brilliant. Members, um, we are now being broadcast throughout Parliament Buildings Online. And apologies for the delay, starting some technical difficulties as is often the case. We're a year into online meetings, but it still happens so often. So um, can I just remind everybody that we are being recorded and this meeting is being broadcast through the Assembly's website. And we currently have six of our seven members attend the video conference and we have myself, Emma Sheeran, the chair. We've got Mike Nesbitt, our vice chair, Carol Nicole, Paula Bradshaw, Michelle McElveen and Mark Durkin. So the first item on our agenda is apologies. We don't have any formal apologies, but Christopher Stalford isn't with us yet, so he may join the meeting uh, later on. And we can move then to our second item, which is our briefing this afternoon from RAISE. So I want to welcome Eileen Reagan and Stephen Orme to the meeting. We had asked um, at one of our previous sessions for an information session on gender budgeting and on the implementation of the CEDAW uh, recommendations, which obviously the, the UK proceeded into law in 1986, I think it was. Um, so, Stephen and Eileen, thank you for joining us this afternoon. And if you want to begin your briefing, apologies for holding you up there. No problem. Good morning, good afternoon, rather, Chair. Um, Stephen and I are here, and we have two separate briefing papers that you will have received. Mine is about gender budgeting and Stevens is about CEDAW and the Istanbul Convention. So um, given the, the amount of time that we have and the way how the papers are separate, um, we propose that I present, Stephen then presents, and then we take questions at the end, if that's okay, Chair. Okay, so I'll start out here with the um, gender budgeting briefing. Uh, the committee, I understand, has been looking, obviously, at various issues relating to gender in terms of its uh, terms of reference in general um, for uh, constituting a Bill of Rights. So in the context of gender budgeting, you were the committee was particularly interested in legal bases. Um, there are several different types of gender budgeting approaches used by government. Um, I'm going to first, though, before we move into that, I'm going to talk to you about just a few context setting pieces of information that really are essential grounding for you when you go to look at the issue of gender budgeting for the purposes of the committee. Um, one of the things, first of all, is terms and concepts. It's really important to bear in mind that gender budgeting is not just about um, sex. <laughs> Um, it's not just about, you know, women and girls and men and boys. Um, it also is about intersex as well. Um, another thing to bear in mind is um, it is um, clearly established through evidence that gender disparities in Northern Ireland and they require attention um, going forward. Um, there's, it's important that the committee appreciates that gender mainstreaming was uh, emerges from the literature as a, an initial approach in trying to redress some of the gender disparities that exist in Northern Ireland and elsewhere, but it has since emer merged into a concept um, uh, like a subcontext text, I guess, of um, called gender budgeting, and that's what we're going to focus in on now. The briefing you have. I uh, draw your attention to pages um, in the original paper itself, pages four through nine, because I think that would be helpful if you're looking to have more detailed understanding of those concepts. But given time, I can't go in in great length. Um, but very basically, if you're thinking about gender budgeting use in government, um, you're thinking about a gender sensitive government approach to challenging persistent gender disparities and it extends gender mainstreaming so that you're taking the gender sensitive lens and you're bringing it into decision making that specifically concerns expenditure and revenue. And you're looking to integrate um, social perceptions into the financial planning and the budgeting of the government through special processes as well as analytical tools to support those processes. So you use it in budgeting, but also related decision making. Maybe it's the decision making in terms of the formulation of the budget, but also the outworking of the budget. When you're executing the budget, it's used concurrently and then used ex post 
when you are looking at resource accounts um, and you're looking back at what was done. But it's also used in terms of, um, within that context, say with the, um, the formulation of the budget, ex ante, you're looking at it to see how you may use revenue making measures um, that maybe have a, uh, a positive um, effect in terms of seeking to address gender disparities. You'll be familiar with the recent tampon tax debate. Um, that's an example of a gender budgeting measure. Um, so if we think about Northern Ireland, um, Northern Ireland does seek to provide a gender neutral approach, um, and it's, that's done primarily through the Section 75 mechanisms. But as I'm sure the committee is familiar, um, the Equality Commission has said uh, the budget and its processes should be going through that Section 75 lens. However, um, it maybe isn't being done to the extent, the full extent that it should be done or as rigorously as it should be done. The um, Department for Communities Minister uh, recently appointed a uh, gender equality strategy expert advisory panel, and they um, confirmed that uh, gender equality hasn't been a policy priority in Northern Ireland. So that panel is going to continue to work with the Minister for Communities in order to try and draft the gender strategy, which I understand, you know, they're looking at potentially using um, gender budgeting within that process. Um, and of course, you'll know the executive approved um, the gender, that there should be a gender strategy and that there should be a panel set up. Um, uh, ARC, uh, a local organization in Northern Ireland composing, uh, consisting of academics, um, this time in, particularly in relation to Ulster University, they've adduced um, a whole body of evidence that um, demonstrates that there is serious attention needed to be given to the embedded gender inequalities which impact lives of women here in Northern Ireland. Um, but as I said earlier to you, it's thinking about gender more widely than just for women. It's about gender for men as well and gender for other. So um, arguably additional studies need, need to be done in those areas as well. And potentially it's worth us um, or the committee revisiting um, a report that was done back in 2013 um, that had been commissioned by the Equality Commission to see how uh, gender budgeting tools could be used going forward in Northern Ireland. Um, I won't rehearse all the political agreements and legislation that relate to gender, because I'm sure you're fully aware of them. But I would say that um, there's some questions that may merit the committee's attention that are outlined on page 12 of the briefing paper. And it's basically, um, if the committee wishes to engage with the executive in terms of how it thinks um, the Section 75 roles and responsibilities could be better used to redress the gender disparities. It might be interesting to have that kind of an exchange and to get their views on um, how they think gender budgeting most effectively works. Is it through um, approaches using a legal basis, including a constitutional or other? Um, and it may merit also engaging with um, the Department of Finance on that issue because there's um, a lot of work afoot in this area. Um, but more widely, the issue of gender budgeting also um, has relevance in relation to formulating the forthcoming program for government, the outcomes model, outcomes framework that is, and related um, indicators and the gender strategy that I had spoken to you about. Um, and it will be with great interest that we look at the executive budget that's coming forward. Um, in terms of looking at what exists um, elsewhere, um, there's an awful lot of good practice to draw on. Um, the literature is very rich. The OECD has a very extensive um, collection of studies and ongoing work in the area now for nearly a decade. Um, there, if you look in your packs on page 12, it outlines the various reports that they very seriously have undertaken since 2015 that um, includes different types of recommendations, different principles that should be applied, particularly when gender budgeting, as well as um, more recently in 2020, they've provided a pathway to action when you're designing and implementing gender budgeting. 
and for the purposes of the paper, I drew off the back quite heavily. Um, so far, it's found out of all the OECD countries, there's 34 of them, 17 have introduced some kind of gender budgeting mechanism. Not all of them, remember, are with legal bases. Um, and there still are a considerable number of um, OECD countries where it's not practiced. But it's, um, there's different conceptualizations that underpin the models. Um, either you're looking to have an gender-informed resource allocation, or you're trying to have a gender-assessed budget, or you're trying to look for a needs-based gender budgeting system. Um, again, there's a number of questions that the committee may wish to um, put its attention to in terms of how best it could be, gender budgeting could be translated from theory into practice within Northern Ireland so that it's strategic, it's methodical, and also that it's sustainable and effective. Um, so the OECD says some things to think about is do you use a legal basis, legislation, or constitutional? Do you have to think about high-level political commitment and convention, as well as administrative practices, or specifically a constitutional requirement? Or are you thinking of just trying to um, ensure compliance with prevailing international law or some kind of an instrument that specifically speaks to the issue of gender budgeting? Um, countries that have a legal basis to date for gender budgeting are Austria, Iceland, Spain, and Korea. Out of the, um, the examples of the 17 that I noted that have a legal basis, in your packs, uh, in your um, paper that you received from me on page 17, it outlines what those entail. Austria, it's in the Constitution itself that it commits the public administrations to equal status. And then there's an accompanying federal law and regulations that go with that to ensure equality, but it's between men and women. In Iceland, they use the Constitution, again, to enshrine the principle of equality. Um, and it, again, it's between men and women, and that's since 2016. But they also underpin that with various tools and have a very um, comprehensive gender-responsive budgeting plan and they have appropriate mechanisms to support that um, and the officials when doing so. Spain has a system where they, um, again, it's, it's legislative and they, do, they undertake a gender impact assessment report for every single piece of uh, draft bill that goes before the legislature. Um, and it's, um, they also um, have established a requirement where there's a draft budget bill that has to be accompanied by the gender impact report. Um, Korea, they have a system where they have a, a National Finance Act where they require um, gender budget statements. Um, none of those are um, potentially what this particular committee is looking to do if they're trying to enshrine it very specifically that um, the, uh, the BOR would require gender budgeting, or will it go with a more generic approach about gender equality? They're all questions that um, can be asked and considered going forward. Um, on page 18, you'll see the breakdown in a chart of the legal bases that do exist in the country, 17 countries, OECD countries that do currently have gender budgeting. Most of them is through legislation through the examples that I provided there, um, most of the examples that I provided there. Um, the next two largest groups is through high-level political commitment and convention, um, and the next group is administrative practice. The smallest groupings are 12% of the 17 countries where there's a constitutional requirement to undertake gender budgeting, and um, then the other end of the spectrum, you could say, is just complying with what this in international law. Um, out of all the OECD um, good practice literature, the one thing that you becomes most apparent, like is punctuated for you, is that where um, countries don't have the constitutional requirement, um, they do have other means, but the most important. Um, aspect, I guess, to the systems that exist is the high-level political commitment um, to underpin 
um, whatever system they have. I'm conscious of the time here, so um, because uh, Stephen will go next. I, I guess I would encourage the committee, if they are seriously thinking about making a recommendation, which would include gender budgeting, that they would engage specifically with the OECD, um, in particular the Public Governance and Territorial Development Directorate, and speak to them specifically about the countries, the very limited countries that have um, a constitutional means to embed gender budgeting. Um, and again, I, I emphasize the need for maybe engaging with TEO and DOF further on asking some particular questions about gender budgeting within the context of the Fiscal Commission, the Fiscal Council, as well as various discussions that are ongoing about the outcomes-based accountability model and related indicators. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Aileen. Stephen, are you going to pick up there? Sure. Can you hear me okay? Can I just ask you? Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I'll set on. Um, so, yeah, I'll, I'll just pick up right in that thought then. So, um, following Aileen's discussion of gender budget, and my, my presentation and my paper is focused on the other two elements of, of the request. Uh, so, I'll be discussing CEDAW and then um, as the current treaty relating to violence against women in the European context and um, the Istanbul Convention. Um, I'll then also very briefly address some gender equality and human rights protections uh, contained in the Ireland Northern Ireland Protocol to the Withdrawal Agreement, although I'm aware that that's something that the Equality and Human Rights Commissions will be covering in a bit more detail. Um, so firstly, as I say, my paper details the CEDAW Convention, um, and to give that this full title, it's the 1979 UN Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women, so I'll continue to use the term CEDAW from here on. It was fully ratified, as, as the chair mentioned, um, by the UK in 1986, uh, and currently 189 UN member states have ratified that convention. So CEDAW, um, in Article 1 of CEDAW, provides a definition of discrimination against women, and it goes on to commit signatories to ensuring gender equality um, and eliminating discrimination on that basis in a very broad range of areas, um, so like political participation, uh, education, health, on specific issues faced by rural women, for, uh, for just a few examples. And then implementation of CEDAW is overseen by the CEDAW Committee, um, which is a body of experts elected by those signatory countries. Um, so one thing which CEDAW does, which is uh, relevant to the request and to, to this briefing, is it commits signatories to embodying the Convention's gender equality provisions in their uh, uh, national constitutions and other relevant domestic law and that's been done in a very broad range of countries, um, as, as detailed on uh, pages 19 and 20 of the committee pack, so using your page numbers. Um, many countries have added to or amended their constitutions to establish gender equality or prohibit discrimination, and then amended domestic legislation um, consequent to that, with that same goal in mind. And then in addition, in several cases, national supreme courts or constitutional courts have actually relied directly on CEDAW in finding laws to be discriminatory and therefore uh, unconstitutional or uh, invalid. So that's significant, um, and that is probably the main effect of CEDAW in, in that context. While covering that, however, I should also flag that quite a large number of countries have relied upon existing uh, constitutional law or domestic law to lodge reservations to CEDAW, and that basically means um, you know we, we sign up to CEDAW except for this particular bit and we're sticking with the national law in that context. Uh, so those countries are listed on page 18 of the committee pack, and the main reservations lodged against CEDAW on, on, those, on the basis of constitutional or domestic law are um, to retain effectively gendered laws of royal succession, um, asserting the superiority of Islamic Sharia law where that exists, and then retaining traditional titles and marital customs um, over, over CEDAW provision. So, Constitutions and bills of rights have been used on both sides of the coin in that way. They've been they've been amended to reflect the CEDAW provision, but they've also occasionally been relied upon to lodge reservations or objections against CEDAW. Um, in terms of actually implementing CEDAW in day-to-day -day experience, the main finding from the literature is that incorporating CEDAW into constitutional or bill of rights law is a valuable starting point, but is not necessarily sufficient on its own. Um, looking into that area, 
I reviewed a lot of the work of the CDOC committee, which, as I say, oversees that convention's implementation, and then some of the broader academic literature on, on CDAW's overall impact. Um, the case studies on pages 21 and 22 of the committee pack demonstrate effectively a, a hierarchy of ways in which CDAW principles of gender equality can be realized. So at the top, there is that constitutional or Bill of Rights law. Um, below that, there's more detailed or specific domestic legislation focused on gender equality and maybe in specific areas like employment or social security. And then below that, again, there is case law and judicial interpretations of those sources that I've just outlined. And then below that, again, and ultimately, there is um, what I would term public administration. And by that, I mean the day-to-day -day delivery and decision-making and prioritizations of government, um, in this case, with the goal of gender equality in mind. And the literature really indicates that all four of those elements are required to work in tandem to fully realize CDAW principles of gender equality in practice. And the paper details several case studies, uh, such as South Africa, where constitutional gender equality is not effectively reinforced by further strong domestic legislation or by actual government prioritization of that goal of gender equality. Um, on the other hand, there are countries like Sweden, where there is strong constitutional and further domestic gender equality legislation. And gender equality is embedded into government decision-making structures through things like uh, gender impact assessments and extensive and quite deeply embedded training for civil servants and public officials on their obligations on that front. Um, and given that, and given the example of Sweden, uh, current plans to incorporate CEDAW into Scots law would also be of interest to the committee. Um, in 2018, the Scottish Government's Human Rights Advisory Group recommended the passage of an Act of the Scottish Parliament, which would explicitly codify several international human rights treaties, including CEDAW, uh, into Scots law. Since those recommendations, um, work has been ongoing to give effect to that. Um, beyond that, uh, the advisory group at that time made several other recommendations, which really aimed at practically realizing the human rights included in any primary act. Um, and those included a national mechanism for monitoring the implementation of any rights, and then extensive government capacity building to ensure that they were truly you know, practically implemented. And those recommendations, as per that kind of hierarchy I've just discussed, they're very much focused on ensuring that any constitutional rights are effectively reinforced by detailed further domestic legislation, and then finally well delivered in practice and, and experience. Um, so in terms of CEDAW and gender equality in the context of the particular circumstances of Northern Ireland, um, as the committee will be aware, and the Good Friday Agreement signatories affirmed their commitment to specific rights, and those included equal opportunity regardless of gender and the right of women to full and equal political participation. And again, as the committee will be far more aware than I am, um, there's been considerable debate over what constitutes the particular circumstances of Northern Ireland. Um, and it's in a 2008 report, the Bill of Rights Forum uh, offered both a narrow and a broader view of particular circumstances, the narrow view being very focused on mutual respect and parity of esteem, uh, of esteem uh, between the two main communities here, and the broader view explicitly incorporating a much uh, larger set of elements, including uh, women's rights. In a consequent Northern Ireland Office consultation on next steps on the Bill of Rights, um, the NIO kind of emphasised the existing Section 75 and 76 rights in the Northern Ireland Act and expressed concern that expanding rights uh, could weaken those existing protections. Um, but since then, many women's sector groups have continued to emphasise the relevance of CEDAW to domestic law and policy and have called for CEDAW to be actively incorporated into those sorts of fields. Um, I know that was something that they did in the committee's recent consultation, and it was it was presentations from those groups that kind of led to this request, so the committee will be aware that that's going on. Um, so to close that initial discussion of CEDAW, uh, in writing the paper, we identified three potential issues which the committee might wish to consider further. So firstly, whether and in what form CEDAW principles of gender equality and eliminating discrimination or a necessary response to the particular circumstances of Northern Ireland. And then secondly, drawing on the experience of other CEDAW signatories, uh, whether gender equality within a Bill of Rights would be sufficient, or if it would be more effective if accompanied by consequent changes in domestic law and uh, public administration. And then if so, how could a Bill of Rights direct or frame that sort of work? 
And then finally, uh, what learning could be taken from ongoing work of the Scottish Government to codify CEDAW along with other international treaties into Scots law? Um, so I'll move on then to consideration of the violence against women element of the committee's request, and in particular in that context to the Istanbul Convention. Um, so I won't rehearse the full title of that convention, it's pretty lengthy as well. It's normally referred to as the Istanbul Convention after the city in which uh, it was opened for signature. 44 countries have signed the convention and 33 have ratified it. Um, the convention works to prevent and combat violence against women and domestic violence and is based on four pillars, uh, prevention, protection, prosecution and coordinated policies. Um, it requires the amendment of signatories domestic law in those areas and uh, provision for then international cooperation in relation to those changes. In some ways, the Istanbul Convention can be understood as maybe subordinate or within the broader principles of CEDAW. Where CEDAW is concerned with the overarching principle of gender equality and eliminating gender discrimination, uh, Istanbul is focused on the specific topic or even policy area of, of violence against women. In terms of the UK's position in relation to Istanbul, uh, the UK signed the convention in 2012, but hasn't yet ratified it. And that means that under international law, the UK is not yet bound by the convention's provisions. A private member's bill was passed by the UK Parliament in 2017 and would require the UK government to report annually on steps it's taken to allow it to ratify the convention. Um, and the most recent government report indicates that Parliament is uh, very close to passage of a piece of legislation that would satisfy several requirements of the Istanbul Convention. And if and when that's enacted, uh, the UK might then be in a position to actually ratify it. So because it's mainly concerned with domestic, criminal and procedural law and associated pieces of legislation, the Istanbul Convention has generally not resulted in amendments or additions to constitutions or bills of rights. Um, there are a small number of outliers detailed in the paper, but overall, uh, national constitutions and bills of rights are not really engaged by Istanbul. Um, a more typical path in terms of satisfying the convention is for signatories to amend their domestic law um, to satisfy its requirements. Uh, and considering the uh, countries that have done this so far, many have not done so fully, really, and that maybe isn't a surprise given the convention is still quite young. Um, for example, in several case studies in the paper, specifically Italy, Serbia and Spain. Changes to domestic law required by the Convention aren't complete and they're also not really reinforced thoroughly in day-to-day -day delivery in public administration. Um, so in many ways the, the literature indicates that what's required for effective implementation of Istanbul and on the violence against women front is very similar to CEDAW. And that harks back to what I was saying earlier that Istanbul and violence against women can be understood as subordinate to the broader principles of CEDAW it's possible to have CEDAW-like principles at the constitutional or Bill of Rights level, whereas violence against women content, by comparison, and at least in relation to Istanbul, tends to sit lower than that and within, within those broad CEDAW principles, and is more typically a matter for routine domestic law and enforcement. And in both cases, there's that hierarchy of constitutional and Bill of Rights law, then other domestic law, then relevant case law, and then ultimately day-to-day -day public administration and government um, and all of those are necessary and interlink in delivering both conventions and practice and um, so in terms of violence against women and the northern irish context in particular uh, in 2009 as the committee will recall the human rights commission provided their formal advice to the secretary of state on a uh, potential bill of rights and that recommended that any bill of rights should include supplementary rights in a broad range of areas including freedom from domestic violence, sexual violence, and gender-related harassment. As I mentioned earlier, the NAO's response was to lean back on existing Section 75 and 76 rights and express concern that expanding rights could weaken those existing protections. But that being said, it's still noteworthy that at that point, the Human Rights Commission's recommendations were for explicit freedoms from domestic violence and related areas to be included in the Bill of Rights. Um, so, to close this discussion of violence against women and the Istanbul Convention, in writing the paper, again, we identified uh, three potential issues that the committee might wish to consider further. Um, so, these are similar in many respects to those identified for CEDAW. Um, firstly, whether and in what form the eradication of violence against women is a necessary response to the particular circumstances of Northern Ireland. 
Secondly, whether inclusion in the Bill of Rights would be sufficient to achieve the goal of eradicating violence against women. And then thirdly, if not, how could or how should a Bill of Rights enable and direct changes in further domestic law and enforcement to, to achieve that goal? So finally then, I'll turn very briefly uh, to the uh, brief point in relation to the human rights and equality protections in the Ireland Northern Ireland Protocol for the Withdrawal Agreement. Um, so I should point out at this stage, this is based purely upon what is stated in the relevant section of the protocol itself. Um, RAISE doesn't provide legal advice or opinion, and we would avoid any kind of active interpretation of those documents. Um, but the Human Rights and Equality Commissions are, of course, before the committee later today, and we'll be able to talk to that in greater detail. Um, and the committee can also seek you know, further expert or legal opinion as, as it wants to. Um, so having said that, Committee members will be aware that in Article 2 of the protocol, the UK government committed to creating uh, dedicated mechanisms to uphold six EU, rights, uh, EU human rights and equality directives. Um, those directives prohibit discrimination on a range of grounds, including gender in relation to today, um, and in areas including things like employment and social security. As a result of that commitment, the UK government, uh, the executive and all other public bodies must abide by those directives in Northern Ireland as they stood on the 31st of December uh, 2020. So given that those protocol provisions are obviously possibly relevant to considerations of the future Bill of Rights, as they provide for specific and internationally located human rights and equality protections on a range of grounds, and in the context of today's briefings, that includes gender. So the committee might therefore want to consider and seek further evidence on two issues arising from that. So. Firstly, how the directive specified in Article 2 of the protocol and then UK government obligations would interact with any obligations created by a new Northern Irish uh, Bill of Rights. And then secondly, how any de dedicated mechanisms, as are mentioned in Article 2, would interact with any sort of delivery mechanisms for, for a Bill of Rights again. Um, and of course, Amora, this is going, as I say, that the Human Rights and Equality Commissions will, will consider themselves later on in the meeting. Um, so, that's all in terms of the presentation. Um, thanks for your attention and your patience. Um, um, we're happy to take any questions. Thank you to you both for that really comprehensive briefing and I suppose the, the notes that were provided both in, in the original pack and in the table papers were useful in giving context to all of this and sort of the legal background. Um, I just have one question and it might not be something that you want to give an answer to, perhaps something more for comment, but Obviously, the conversations that we've been having over the course of the past year or more now about a Bill of Rights and their function, and my thinking on it is that a Bill of Rights acts almost like an accountability mechanism as sort of a, a standard or a baseline to which governments and ministers and departments try to act towards or use as their sort of standard that they have to meet. And in a lot of ways, the conventions sort of provide that same sort of function I'm thinking of her recent law change around provision of women's health care and the role that CEDAW had in that in, in finding that abortion provision in the North wasn't in line with the recommendations of that report. Um, also, gender budgeting is probably a means to an end as a something, you know, a tool that you use to achieve gender equality. So if equality of opportunity for for men and women was something that we put in the Bill of Rights gender budgeting is something that you might use to, to achieve that aim. So I just wondered if there were any um, comments that you had on that. Um, I, I can take the one in relation to gender budgeting and then Stephen, you might want to comment in relation to the other. Um, it, it depends on what kind of model you're you're going to go with. Are, are you The Bill of Rights can't um, provide a laundry list for every single little aspect, um, permutation of gender equality that's being sought. So is gender budgeting a tool that should have a, a Bill of Rights basis in terms of gender equality and then look to what exists within the jurisdiction, such as Section 75, and ensure the strategy, OBA, and any other supporting tools, um, right down to supporting um, the development of a culture where officials have the requisite knowledge, skills, and understanding in order to ensure that they're um, gender proofing, gender undertaking gender budgeting when they're doing the budget. Um, so it, it just, 
it um, it depends on how you conceptually um, think about the means by which you're going to try to um, implement, uh, transpose, and implement um, gender equality. Um, yeah, I suppose I could pick up on the point you made about um, the the you know CEDAW and other conventions maybe setting the baseline. Um, it does touch on something that's in the paper, but it didn't really touch on in, in the presentation though. Um, and it might, might be material. There, there's a distinction the committee might be familiar with in terms of some in some states being monist in terms of their international law and some states being dualist. Um, and obviously, so like a monist state like France, when Emmanuel Macron effectively, when he signs a treaty, that, that, that treaty then has a full force of law in, in France. Um, because the UK is a dualist system, um, and it, you know, without getting into um, the specifics of, of the example you took there, uh, it wasn't until the UK Parliament kind of actively transposed the recommendations of that particular CEDAW committee report into primary legislation um, in, in the UK that that those recommendations and those rights that the CEDAW committee saw as existing um, were realised. So that might speak to, um, you know, ultimately these are judgments for the committee and many other stakeholders besides, but the fact that the UK and um, legally speaking um, and legislatively speaking Northern Ireland within that the fact that it is a dualist system might um, increase the importance of having specific rights in a in a Northern Irish Bill of Rights rather than relying on um, international conventions because because it's a dualist system as opposed to the monist system that other countries have and um, we're that little bit more disconnected from uh, the obligations kind of and the, the standards in international treaties. Yeah. Appreciate what you're, what you're both saying there, um, and, and thank you. I don't think any other members have raised their hands. Does anybody else want to come in with a comment or question? I'm not getting anyone. So, look, you have, you have covered it so comprehensively there that no one else has anything that they need to ask. So, at this point, I would just um, thank you both very much for attending. Stephen, I think you class of 2013 as well, are you? Yes. Yeah, I thought that. We did, the same, we did the same uni course. And I was I was looking at you there going, why do I know, why do I know that? <laughs> I know, yeah, okay. <laughs> You're starting to panic. <laughs> well, I'm going to let you drop off the call here now and we're going to take our next presentation. So thanks very much, Steve. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Bye-bye. Members, we've now got our presentation from the Equality and Human Rights Commission. So if we can give them a minute to be brought up into the spotlight. I think we have everyone now. So um, I want to take this opportunity to welcome you all to the committee this afternoon. Uh, members, we've got a presentation now from the Human Rights Commission and the Equality Commission. So on the call, we have Les Allenby, who is the Chief Commissioner of the Human Rights Commission. We've got Ayla Shahi, who is the Head of Service and the Dedicated Mechanism of EU Withdrawal Team within the Human Rights Commission. We've got Shirley McGahey, who's the Chief Commissioner of the Equality Commission. And we've got Rocky Mallon, who is director of the Dedicated Mechanism Unit in the Equality Commission as well. So, if you want to begin your briefing. Okay, um, thank you, Emma. Um, good afternoon, members. Um, thank you for the invitation to speak to you today and to present some further evidence in the context of the committee's consideration of a Bill of Rights and the implications of Brexit for human rights. As you said, Les and I are joined today by our respective commissions, directors of dedicated mechanism units, Roisin and Eilish, and they will assist Les and I in terms of answering any questions that members might have when we've both finished our presentations. So as you know, we recently gave evidence to the committee on how a Bill of Rights could help to promote equality of opportunity and strengthen equality protections for people in Northern Ireland. 
And as we previously made clear, we support the adoption of a strong and inclusive Bill of Rights, reflecting the particular circumstances of Northern Ireland. We also set out in our previous evidence and our submission to the committee in advance of this meeting today, a number of recommendations that related primarily to the impact of Brexit on equality and human rights. Our recommendations are made in the context of our role and our remit, both under the equality legislation and working with the Northern Ireland Human Rights Commission as part of the dedicated mechanism established under Article 2 of the Ireland Northern Ireland Protocol. And maybe before elaborating on our specific recommendations, I thought it might be helpful to the committee if I started by briefly outlining the nature and implications of the UK government's commitment under Article 2 and the role that the commissions as will play as a dedicated mechanism. So in terms of the UK government's commitment, it has committed under Article 2 to ensuring that certain equality and human rights in Northern Ireland will continue to be protected after Brexit. In particular, it has committed to ensuring that the protections currently in place in Northern Ireland regarding the rights, safeguards and equality of opportunity provisions as are set out in the relevant chapter of the Belfast Good Friday Agreement, are not reduced as a result of Brexit. It has also committed in the protocol to ensuring that certain equality laws in Northern Ireland will keep pace with any future changes to the EU equality laws, which are set out in Annex 1 to the protocol. Now, this commitment is a recognition of the importance and the centrality of rights and equality protections in the Belfast Good Friday Agreement and of the fact that this agreement has underpinned the peace processes here. The commitment binds the UK government as a matter of international law. In addition, the Northern Ireland Assembly or Executive cannot act in a way that is compatible with that commitment. Both commissions have been given additional powers and responsibilities to ensure that this commitment is met, including providing advice to government and monitoring, enforcing and on reporting on the ongoing implementation of the commitment. In terms of our specific views and recommendations on the Bill of Rights, we are clear that additional measures are required to better protect equality and human rights in Northern Ireland, and this is particularly important in the context of Brexit, which has impacted on the equality and human rights protections here. A Bill of Rights provides an opportunity to increase protection where existing law is inadequate and to strengthen the human rights protection afforded to the most vulnerable and marginalised in our society. And it's therefore particularly important that consideration is given as to how a Bill of Rights might strengthen equality and human rights in the context of these impacts of Brexit. The need for this consideration is also essential in the context of our previous recommendation to the committee that a Bill of Rights should be fit for purpose, both for today, the present time, and for future generations of people in Northern Ireland. Running now to some of the specific impacts of Brexit on equality and human rights, the committee will be aware that EU laws, particularly on anti-discrimination, have formed an important part of the framework for delivering the guarantees on rights and equality in Northern Ireland. They have provided a minimum level of rights and protection below which laws in the UK could not fall below. These EU laws have covered equality rights as well as other important areas such as employment rights of part-time workers, pregnant workers and victims. We remain concerned about the negative impact of equality and human rights as a result of the EU Charter of Fundamental Rights, no longer forming part of UK domestic law post-Brexit, including in Northern Ireland. We do note, however, that the Charter will continue to play an important role in the interpretation of the withdrawal agreement and the protocol. Nonetheless, we are of the view that the exclusion of the Charter from domestic law, despite the retention of underlying fundamental rights and principles, has resulted in a weakening of protection of human rights. Further, I would wish to draw to the attention of the committee the fact that there are important limitations to the UK government's commitments under Article 2 in terms of the continued application of EU equality and human rights standards in Northern Ireland. For example, the commitment to keep pace with any future changes to EU law only applies to the six equality directives that are set out in Annex 1 to the protocol. 
and not to other existing EU directives that provide rights for equality groups, such as the EU law relating to part-time workers or pregnant workers. In addition, the Keeping Pace commitment does not cover future equality-related directives that may be introduced, except to the extent that they might result in changes to the Annex 1 directive to those six directives. This means that whilst equality laws in other EU countries, including the Republic of Ireland, could be strengthened to keep pace with those future EU equality laws, Northern Ireland equality laws may not similarly be strengthened and may fall behind. And you'll recall that I previously advised that Northern Ireland equality law already falls behind the level of protections enjoyed by citizens in other parts of the UK, and therefore the situation could be further compounded. We are also concerned that those areas of equality and human rights currently enshrined in Northern Ireland domestic law that are not covered by the non-regression commitment in Article 2.1 could also be subject to change. We have already highlighted to the committee our recommendation that a Bill of Rights should include the principle of equality. Including a principle of equality would be a recognition of the importance and centrality of rights and equality protections in the Belfast Food Friday Agreement and could also underpin Northern Ireland's equality legislation. We have already raised with the committee the significant gaps in protection between equality law in Great Britain and Northern Ireland, and that people in Northern Ireland have less protection against discrimination and harassment in certain areas than those in Great Britain. These include in areas relating to obligations placed on public bodies not to discriminate under anti-discrimination legislation, we stress again that a key action that the executive could take to enhance protection of equality and human rights is to update, strengthen and harmonise upwards our equality legislation, including to address those gaps in protection between Northern Ireland and Great Britain. Further, in light of the limitations of Article 2 of the protocol that I have just mentioned, another key action that the executive could take as regards areas that fall within its default competence is to ensure that Northern Ireland keeps pace with all future EU laws that strengthen equality and human rights, including protections that enhance equality and human rights in the workplace. We have also raised previously in our evidence that we recommend the committee considers how best to ensure that international human rights standards are set out in a range of international human rights conventions, including conventions that relate to the rights of women, disabled people, minority ethnic people and children, are reflected in the Bill of Rights and in any underpinning legislation. We have stressed the need for the executive to take action to address key shortfalls in Northern Ireland so as to ensure compliance with the UK government's obligations under international human rights conventions, including under conventions relating to women, disabled people and minority ethnic groups. Indeed, what you heard from the previous uh, speakers. I hope that this overview has given the committee members a sense of our key concerns and I'm happy to, to address any of the points that the committee may have in relation to the points I've made. But I'll now hand over to Les to speak to you on behalf of the Northern Ireland Human Rights Commission. Thank, thank you, Geraldine. Um, <clears throat> I want to make two um, key points. Um, our starting point is to go back to first principles and the 1998 agreement. Um, the Bill of Rights was designed to be part of the architecture to ensure a durable peace and also part of the recognition of the importance of human rights and equality in Northern Ireland in moving forward to uh, a better future. And of course, the Bill of Rights was designed to go beyond the rights in the European Convention to reflect the principles of mutual respect for the identity and ethos of both communities and equality of treatment, the right not to be discriminated against and equal opportunity to be provided across both public and private sector. All of that was to be done while reflecting the particular circumstances of Northern Ireland. Um, and that is about recognizing that where we were in the Good Friday Belfast Agreement, uh, but to tie it to an umbilical cord to the present day. Um, it sits, of course, a Bill of Rights was designed to sit alongside other provisions in the agreement, including enshrining the consent principle and into any constitutional change and the recognition that the people of Northern Ireland 
should be able to freely identify as British or Irish or both without any adverse consequences. Leaving the EU does have rights consequences. Geraldine has outlined um, some of them. EU law is no longer uh, supreme um, over the United Kingdom under the Euro European Communities Act of 1972. But there are a significant number of excep exceptions within the main withdrawal agreement and with other arrangements to leave, including the Ireland Northern Ireland Protocol, particularly around the single market and um, uh, customs arrangements, and to a much more limited extent uh, around Article 2 of the Ireland Northern Ireland Protocol. As Geraldine outlined, we've lost the EU Fundamental Charter of Rights, uh, which applies to issues of EU law in its current form, though we have retained elements within the Westminster Withdrawal Agreement and arguably a greater element through the Ireland and Northern Ireland Protocol. There are, of course, then the additional protections based on the 1998 agreement and the non-diminution of rights under the rights, safeguards and equality of, of opportunity section of the agreement. And they are important safeguards. And we, amongst others, are the custodians of, of that through the dedicated mechanism. Um, but they refer to only one section of the agreement and they're not a substitute for a Bill of Rights. And I guess that's my first key um, point today. The non-diminution commitment um, does have an element of keeping pace with certain EU directives, um, but the rest is about uh, staying where we are. It must fall within scope of one section of the agreement. It must be rights that applied between the day of when we left uh, uh, and the day we voted to leave. So between the 23rd of June 2016 and the 31st of December 2020, and any dilution or diminution of rights or loss of rights altogether must be as a result of leaving the EU. So a Bill of Rights remains a legitimate unfinished piece of business within the agreement, uh, the 1998 agreement. And frankly, it comes into its own in times of political and economic instability. And I understand and the Commission understands that it must fall within the parameters of the agreement. It must command support ultimately, first of all, amongst members of your committee, chair, and then beyond, ultimately to the wider public and eventually to the UK government um, and both governments in terms of their uh, stewardship of the agreement as a whole. Now, that inevitably means compromises, yet it must also mean that any Bill of Rights that we have is meaningful and accessible in order to provide reassurance and clarity for everyone as to what their rights are, regardless of where political and economic circumstances take us in the future. And that's my second uh, key point. And um, like Geraldine, more than happy to take questions on the specifics of the dedicated mechanism, the loss of rights and the um, interaction between um, uh, where we are and where a Bill of Rights might take us. Thank you. Thank you very much to you both um, and to, to everyone involved in the, the preparation for the, the presentations today and the written presentations that you provided us with. Um, I suppose I want to ask about, and I've, I know that we have met on different occasions and we've had presentations from some of you through my other committee as well, and a lot of this overlaps when we're talking about Brexit and the impact of Brexit on rights and for citizens here. And we've been talking about the different formats for a Bill of Rights, and I have said, if you caught the earlier part of this afternoon's meeting where I was talking about a Bill of Rights as an accountability mechanism, and one of the things that has been discussed is the idea of pre legislative scrutiny and how that would prevent governments being constantly dragged before the courts. And I know that there is a provision within the Good Friday Agreement for uh, a committee to sort of assess compatibility with each of the other. And obviously, of what we're talking around during the Good Friday Agreement in terms of the, the Bill of Rights as going further than ECHR and uh, furnishing citizens with additional rights. I wondered if you would give a perspective on that. Um, 
Yeah, if I kick off, Geraldine, is that okay? Yeah. Go ahead. Um, <clears throat> yeah, in our 2008 um, uh, 9 advice, um, the Commission uh, recommended having pre legislative scrutiny through a distinct um, assembly human rights kind of committee to look at human rights issues. We then went on to look at other kinds of um, enforcement, and we then were looking at preferred a method of um, inculcating, if you like, any enforceability uh, through the courts, but not with a, a separate kind of um, human rights um, uh, court. Um, I thought the, the piece of work done by the Human Rights Consortium um, recently was a really thoughtful and considered piece of work. It set out a number of options. One was that pre-legislative scrutiny by the Assembly and how you might amend the ministerial code, but it was one of five um, possible ways of looking at this, um, including socioeconomic requirements and specific legislation. I think there was con constitutionalizing economic and social rights principles where the Assembly had a principal responsibility to implement, a progressive um, implementation, which is uh, a quite common uh, provision in international human rights standards, and some access to judicial review, for example, on grounds of reasonableness, or then incorporating um, economic and social rights in future free trade agreements. They're not mutually exclusive, um, and it seems to me that um, the idea of pre-legislative scrutiny makes immense sense. You have a joint committee on human rights in, in Westminster, uh, for example, um, and early scrutiny of legislation, um, it seems to me, is in everyone's interests. And it's something that we endorsed a number of years ago, and I think we still think has has significant merit. Yeah, Emma, if I could just add to that in terms of the um, pre-legislative scrutiny, I think Section 75 and 76 um, really have set a standard, um, a minimum standard, really, in terms of that kind of scrutiny. Um, ministers, the executive departments, etc., are versed in terms of applying the Section 75 criteria and screening policies at very early stages. So we would be keen to see some kind of a model developed in terms of how that similar process could be applied and put the requirements very much to the fore in terms of how uh, policy and legislation would be developed. Thank you. Um, Geraldine, you spoke there quite extensively about the fact that the North is sort of in a rights deficit and obviously no single equality act. And I know that in the presentation you talked about a bill of rights almost as sort of a, a means to have a harmonization of rights, particularly in the wake of the loss of some of the rights from the EU Charter of Fundamental Rights. And I wonder how you would see that working on an all-Ireland basis. So yesterday we had a presentation at the CEO Committee from um, pro professors uh, Colin Harvey and, and Mark Bassett, Bassett who have done work about the EU and Irish unity and moving forward on sort of a rights basis and if we're having a conversation about the change in the constitutional position that it be on the basis of rights and increasing rights and bringing everyone up to the same standard how that would work then following our exit from the EU and the fact that people in the North now are, are at a difference to neighbours a few miles down the road. Yeah, well, uh, equality legislation really is, is my remit and, and the, the rest of the human rights, I'm sure Les will be able to, to contribute to. But I think there is um, a recognition that equality legislation in particular does lag behind here in Northern Ireland, having been um, a province where our equality legislation was very much to the fore at a time. We now have, have drifted behind the introduction of the Single Equality Act and, and GB has afforded many more rights to citizens than uh, and protections to citizens than we actually have here, particularly in relation to age, um, GFS, etc. cetera. Uh, we also fall behind in terms of the um, race relations and discrimination on those grounds. So I think there's scope within the or there's power within the executive to address some of those issues um i think the introduction of a, a, a principle of equality in a bill of rights will provide or can provide depending on how it's framed 
a lens through which the courts will look at legislation and the interpretation of legislation with an equality focus. But <clears throat> the power to make legislation lies here with our executive uh, and with Westminster. So um, I think that's where it lies, and I, I'm sure Les will have more to contribute to that. Mm -hmm. um, Emma, that's a, a really interesting question and had some quite significant resonances. Um, we did a lot of work with the Irish Human Rights and Equality Commission, including in a discussion uh, with um, UK ministers, with officials in, in, uh, in Brussels, both from the UK, the Irish government and the commission. And in the discussions with the UK, um, we had, as two commissions across the island of Ireland, had made the case for retaining the EU fundamental charter because it would allow the idea of an equivalence of uh, rights to be made more real. Um, and um, we felt that was within the spirit of the uh, Good Friday Agreement. Um, in practice, our um, discussions founded on the UK government were very clear. They said that the agreement um, was about a South-North equivalent and not a reciprocal equivalence. Um, and if you read the text of the agreement, um, that probably is um, a, tenable, um, a tenable argument. But it was one of life's ironies that um, the notion was because the UK already was in an advanced stage of, of incorporating the European Convention into um, domestic law, uh, and the Irish government uh, wasn't at that time, but subsequently did, that there was a need to emphasize South-North equivalents. But I think we remain clear that it's not about having the same rights, North and South, but the idea of, a, of an equivalence of rights that are um, that make sense between the two parts of the island um, would be um, significant and not out of tune with the spirit um, of... Um, the agreement as a whole. Um, I think um, Roisin Mallon, who has been doing some work in this area, might have something more to contribute to your point. Uh, well, just just some further points. Um, thank you, Geraldine. Um, obviously, as Geraldine has mentioned, the the keeping pace. Uh, Commitment under Article 2 only applies to the six Annex 1 Equality Directives. So that means that should, for example, the EU uh, press ahead with its uh, Gender Pay Transparency Directive, uh, then, then that is not covered by Annex 1 and there'd be no obligation for the UK to, to introduce that unless it makes any changes to, to the Annex 1 Directives. Uh, there's also the Work-Life Balance Directive, uh, which, as you know, has been passed uh, by the EU but not implemented in the UK to date. So, so that's not covered within Annex 1 as well. And, and there's, th there is no commitment to keep pace with that. So that if, if that happens in terms of those directives and they become uh, incorporated into domestic law in the Republic, then clearly in certain areas, the rights in the Republic of Ireland, equality rights, could become stronger than those uh, in, um, in Northern Ireland. Um, but you know, one of our recommendations is that the, it, it's open to the executive uh, to uh, introduce uh, equivalent rights in Northern Ireland within its you know, devolved competence in terms of equality law. So it could proactively decide to keep pace, even if there isn't, isn't a requirement by the UK government under uh, Article to do that, but it, it could very well be the case where, where rights in the Republic of Ireland are strengthened because of their continued membership uh, in the EU. Thanks, Roisin. And I suppose an awful lot of this, and I've said this before, even at other committees, an awful lot of the impacts of Brexit on rights haven't really been properly explored yet or recognised or realised by people. And the fact that we're, you know, we've spent this entire period in the middle of a pandemic when there hasn't been the same movement. But as we go on and as directives are sort of employed by the, the 26th century, you have a situation there where you could have a family living in a border region where, you know, one partner works in the 26 counties and lives in the north or the other way around and they're then operating on on different levels and you could start to see the real impacts of that so i suppose going forward 
you know, I would like to see a race-based approach. But thank you very much for your presentation and apologies for taking so much of your time with the questions. I'm going to go to the next uh, member, who's the vice chair, Mike. Yeah, thank you very much, Chair, and, and thank you all for your, for your presentation so far. You have to some extent addressed the, the broad areas that, that I'm interested in, which the non-diminution obligation in the protocol, uh, the commitment to keep in step with any advances that might be made by the EU, and also the jurisdiction of uh, the ECJ in Northern Ireland. Anything that either Geraldine or Les can add in those areas? Yeah, again, if I, if I kick off briefly, um, uh, Mike, the, the um, access to the Court of, the Just, of Justice of the European Union, there are still circumstances in the overall agreement where um, individuals um, will have access to the Court of Justice, so it hasn't completely... Um, gone, but um, the Article 2 provisions, and if a an individual came to either ourselves or the Equality Commission um, saying my rights have been diminished as a result of, uh, uh, from you know, my rights under the rights safeguards and equality of opportunity have been diminished, then um, if we were to take a case to the court, it would be going to the um, uh, domestic courts. Um, so access to the Court of Justice of the European Union is not something that has survived um, uh, the um, our bit of the protocol, if you like. Um, and then on, um, but, but maybe behind the import of your question uh, around, um, yes, only Northern Ireland has to keep pace with the um, those six directives. Um, they are significant because they are covering equal treatment in employment and social security, um, in uh, access to goods and services, uh, in self-employment and freedom from discrimination on, on um, racial and ethnic origin. Um, first of all, of course, the EU must decide to go further than the UK. Um, there's nothing to stop the UK going further. Um, uh, but it's confined to keeping pace with those. The rest of the uh, Article 2 commitment is about not diminishing the existing rights that were in place on the 31st of December 2020. I don't know if that's kind of helpful in terms of uh, access to Court of Justice, etc. Yeah, no, no, that's helpful, Les. Um, so there's the kind of limited protections. Yeah. The, the, yeah, they are limited. It's not. I mean, they're important, um, and they emphasise why the agreement, 1998 agreement, is important. But the idea that they are all embracing somehow, we don't need to think about bill of rights, which is the point I was making. They are, they are not. Um, they are not our bill of rights, or they should not be our bill of rights. They would be a very, very poor substitute for what a bill of rights could potentially do. In, in terms of what a Bill of Rights, I think, was designed to do in, in the agreement. Okay, thank you. Mike, if I just add to that, um, I made reference to the limitations of the Article 2, and I think they are significant. And I think as um, issues arise over the coming period and the courts uh, interpret those situations, I think we will um, put a lot more information. However, I think the fact that Anything that's not covered specifically by the six directives um, is leaving us quite vulnerable in terms of how that legislation could change, either from our own executive or from Westminster, and I think that's a vulnerable thing. Okay, how, how do we cover that in the Bill of Rights, Charlie? I think that the principle of equality um, and taking the opportunity to strengthen the equality legislation, harmonising it upwards with the rest of the United Kingdom would be a good starting point. But a principle of equality that applies a lens through which the courts would interpret other legislation, I think it is uh, a good way forward. But it's something that the Commission is, is continuing to explore and will be in a better position to come back to you with more specific information as to what our views would be and how that could be defined. But it is all about how the uh, principle could be framed in the Bill of Rights. So, and, 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 
important. Sorry, Mike, if I can just add very quickly to that. You have an example. The Commission's view has always been there should be a freestanding right of equality. So unlike the Convention where you have to tie freedom from discrimination to the ambit of another right, and the chart, the fundamental charter was very good at recognizing equality between men and women, for example, and still allowing and recognizing positive action can be taken. So there are some models about how you can how you can do that. So would, would it be useful then to do two things in a Bill of Rights in terms of the kind of um, substantive rights, which we're nailing down in a, to use the current phrase, granular way, you have, you have specific rights and remedies, but also secondly, in, in the sort of preamble, that you make clear that you want rights to be evolving as our understanding of the environment changes. I think that it's it's very important why the Bill of Rights is actually framed. And I think um, being very specific, this is my own personal view, being very specific can limit how that's interpreted and the longevity of the Bill of Rights. I think it becomes very difficult at a later stage to change a Bill of Rights. So therefore, how that is framed um, and its purpose needs to be very clearly defined at the beginning. Uh, so that it does have that longevity and sustainability without the need to, to reframe it, if that makes sense. Yeah, I, I just think, Geraldine, if, if you were talking about the who, what, when, where, or why of rights, mm -hmm. the why belongs in the preamble. Mm -hmm. This is where you justify it, but everything else is, again, you know, to use that phrase, more granular in yeah. the subject of rights, in, yeah. in where part two. Yeah, okay. Yeah. That's useful. Thank you, Chair. No problem, Mike. I've got Paula indicating now if any other members want to ask a question. Um, thank you, um, Chair, and thank you, panel, for coming this afternoon. I've got two questions. Um, the first one is in relation to the issue of the um, commitments for non diminution of rights on the protocol. And I'm conscious that there's sort of an emerging body of opinion, and it's touched upon in this Bill of Rights Committee several times around the inclusion of environmental rights. And obviously a lot of people who were against Brexit were very concerned that we wouldn't be able to keep pace with sort of the, the, the evolving legislation and protections that we, we see at an EU level. So to what degree should we use the opportunity of our Bill of Rights to actually um, sort of um, tie those together? Okay. Les, do you want to come in and address that issue? Uh, yes, thanks, um, Geraldine. Um, I struggle to immediately see how the non-diminution of rights under the rights, safeguards and equality of opportunity would provide very significant safeguards around environmental rights. Remember, um, our uh, application of, of the Article 2 means it must be somewhere within um, the uh, that section of the Good Friday Agreement. But if you go back again to the fundamental charter of rights, environmental protection, and it's only a it's a it's a one or a two line from from um, memory, um, but the right to the something along the lines of the highest standards, and I'm not quoting verbatim, but uh, highest standards of protection or environmental protection is in the EU fundamental charter. Now it only applies in conjunction with EU law rights. Um, uh, so there are examples of how you can. Um, build in um, protection from environmental rights, either within the Charter or from other kind of international standards. But I don't think you're going to find protection for environmental rights falling easily within the um, scope of the non-diminution. Um, no doubt someone may come to us and say, here's a bit of the agreement, and we think it, you know, it, it can be tied to environmental rights but it's not obvious or, or easy to discern how, how you could do that. Okay, thank you. Uh, and my second question is for you, Geraldine. I think it's in, in relation to your paper you submitted, paragraph 4.4, .4, and you talk about the general principles of equality as a fundamental element of international human rights law. Um, mm -hmm. I feel on health for the party, and obviously um, I would be interested in health outcomes, and I'm just wondering to what degree um, a Bill of Rights um, could, could go beyond the sort of equality of access to public services, but more focus on equity of outcome. Mm -hmm. 
No, because everybody can go to school, everybody can access health service, but if there's equity of outcome, then that would allow you then to skew resources or, you know, put up um, particular provision for, for example, the transgender community. So I'm just mm -hmm. wondering around the sort of move more towards equity as opposed to equality of opportunity. Yeah, um, I, I take your point. Um, it's something that we're still examining in detail, but, you know, in terms of the um, inclusion of a, a principle of equality, what we're looking at is as a statement that everyone is equal before and under the law, that they have the right to protection and equal benefit of the law, including the full and equal enjoyment of all rights and freedoms, and could make clear that individuals should not be discriminated against across a range of equality grounds. Um, what we're moving, you're moving away from the, the pure interpretation of equality into the equity of, of the outcome, much in the way the programme for government has moved away from very specific indicators to outcome-based uh, uh, analysis. So I think that that is something that would evolve. Um, we haven't actually been looking at that specifically, and I'm not sure that we have come across in any of our studies of other constitutions and framing of um, bills of rights that they've actually addressed that equity issue but we will continue to look at it. And if we do find that we will be happy to come back and, and share our information with you. Unless Les or Roshin or Elish have anything further that they could add to that? Um, yeah, but just just to maybe to add to that, um, obviously, you know, what one option is to look at, at a quality principle that could be framed in terms of more um, substantive equality in terms of a quality of out, outcome, um, and uh, you know, as opposed to an approach that is simply, uh, you know, a declaratory principle that simply states uh, the, the status quo, so to speak, and, and doesn't really go beyond um, current levels of protection or increased protection. So there are examples from from other constitutions. Uh, whereby you know countries have have sought to go beyond uh, sort of the status quo and, and to increase protection through an equality uh, principle um, and and there's examples of for example this the South Af African Constitution uh, where you know clearly uh, states that uh, you know states for example may not discriminate directly or indirectly on, on various grounds and that legislation must be introduced and enacted to prevent discrimination so that, you know that's one model and other other models are more broad general statements in terms of quality before the law so there are there are a range of, of different ways of framing an, an equality principle and as Durling says that's something we can go come back to the, the committee in more detail on in, in terms of that if that, if that would be would be helpful, but certainly one option is is framing a, a principle, and um, so that it it, it is um, framed in a way of substantive equality. So hopefully that was helpful, um, Paula. Um, and Thanks. Paula, just one thing for me, and then then see if Elish wants to add anything. But um, international standards, uh, particularly economic and social rights, the concept of progressive realization. In effect, you're on the journey towards. Um, the rights being fully implemented. There are ways in which you can talk about duties around making them in, you know, the maximum amount of resources available. There are things that you can do which aren't quite equity, but they are, they are a recognition of um, the fact that both economically and politically some groups and individuals have more power or, and therefore more access than others. Um, so there are there are principles of international standards that can be drawn on, as well as looking at what um, other um, bills of rights have done in practice. No, I, I suppose you're right, and I suppose it is a term we've we've grappled with from the start, and it, it's more of a, a, a very clear intent, you know, that we want to, to you know, a, a more equitable Northern Ireland or our or country, as opposed to you know, sometime in the future we'll have it. So I think it was more just of a a push from the start that this is that this is a clear intent from the executive and the assembly but no appreciate that thank you very much thanks paula and thank you um to the, the presenters i suppose following on from what paula had said there and it was something that i think i was thinking about when i was speaking to the rules presenters earlier in times in terms of how equality and our perception of equality has probably evolved and you know, it's no longer just equality of opportunity and that everyone is treated the same. It's about acknowledging that 
people's particular circumstances or people's characteristics mean that although on paper they have the same equality of opportunity, they actually don't, and therefore the outcome is never or has no chance of being the same. So um, I think that's an important distinction to, to make, and I would agree with the sentiment um, of, of what Paul has said there. I, I don't think any other members have indicated, so at this point, unless any of you have any closing comments, I would just thank you again for your presentations and for your time this afternoon, and thanks for answering all our questions and, and taking the time. Thank you very much, Emma. Thank you, committee. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you. you. Good luck in your deliberations. Thanks. We might need it. <laughs> <laughs> That's brilliant. We'll let this drop off now, and members, we have got one more presentation, so give broadcast in a minute to bring the team from the Children's Law Centre up into the spotlight. Okay, good afternoon. So we've got Patty and Monia. Patty, we can't see your visual, but oh, you're there now. Wasn't sure if you were yep. um, zoomed in or not. So obviously from the Children's Law Centre and members, you'll um, find the, the briefing from the Children's Law Centre in your pack at page 64 of your meeting papers. So I invite you both now to um, give your presentation. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, may I start by thanking the committee for inviting the Children's Law Centre to give evidence to you today. We're very much uh, appreciative of your considering our written submission, which we hope will have proved both interesting and useful for you. For those who don't know me, my name is Paddy Kelly and I'm the director of the Children's Law Centre, or CLC as we're usually refer to. Um, I'm delighted that Ms. Monia Anyadite Danes, QC, is joining me to present to you today and to help answer any questions you might have in respect of our submission. The Children's Law Centre is privileged to have worked closely over many years with Ms. Anyadite Danes in the vindication of children's rights. She is one of or, or possibly the leading children's law expert in this jurisdiction. I would like to acknowledge the assistance of Ms. Anyadite Danes and her colleague, Junior Counsel Mike Scott, BL, in the preparation of the Children's Law Centre's written submission to the Ad Hoc Committee. The Children's Law Centre is a charity work which works towards a society where all children can participate, are valued, have their rights respected and guaranteed without discrimination, and every child can achieve their full potential. We offer training on children's rights, we undertake research and make submissions on law, policy and practice affecting children and young people. We operate a legal advice information representation service and we have a dedicated free phone legal advice line for children and young people called Chalky. We provide legal information through a young person's online chatbot called RE and provide legal advice to young people via live chat. And we also undertake strategic litigation to vindicate children's rights. <clears throat> the focus of our submission reflects what children and young people, their parents and carers have told us through our casework. It also draws on what colleagues across the children's sector have identified as the key denials of children's rights and the significant challenges which children and their families face when trying to access critical services to enable vulnerable children enjoy their childhoods and realise their full potential. Over the last 23 years, the Children's Law Centre have had the privilege of assisting many of you and your colleague MLAs to advocate for your most vulnerable constituents, disadvantaged and vulnerable children. We therefore know you share our concerns about the issues we have identified in our submission. They are issues which you, your constituency offices and your constituents have raised with us through our advice line or representation service. They are issues which defy easy resolution because they're not clearly articulated, there is not a clearly articulated legislative framework which enables children and their families to claim their rights. They are the heartbreaking cases in which decision makers strain to meet the needs of vulnerable children, not because they don't want to do so, but because they're unable to do so, forcing parents and children to resort to costly, energy sapping and time consuming legal action, which may, if lucky, resolve the issue for their child or in a few cases address the specific issues, but do not resolve the systemic problem that ch children are not currently afforded sufficient protection in law. I'd like to draw out for you a few examples from our casework which highlight the inadequacies of current legal protections and the imperative for a strong, enforceable Bill of Rights incorporating the UNCRC. 
27% of our children have identified as having mental health issues. 10% of our 11 to 9 year olds have self-harmed and 1 in 8 have thought about or attempted suicide. These figures are frightening and that's before we even begin to take cognizance of the very significant toll COVID and lockdown has had on our children's mental health. Despite this, there is a dearth of calm services in the community and less than 9% of the total mental health budget is spent on CAMS. We have only one inpatient child mental health facility with only 33 beds. The hospital cannot admit young people with drug and alcohol related issues unless they have a concurrent mental health condition. Children who need CAMS or who have addiction issues cannot access services and some find themselves in the juvenile justice centre where staff struggle to meet their health care needs. Other children tragically self-harm or worse. The rights of children with mental health needs to access CAM services in the community when they need them and where they need them are, are a mirage. I want to give a name, a picture and a voice to these statistics. Gabrielle Connolly, the young woman whose voice echoed from beyond the grave on Radio Ulster this morning, speaking of the consequences of children of not getting timely CAMs, access to CAMs. I want to give her the voice that she did not have in life and read her prophetic words into the record. She said just months before she died, people are being given these waiting times and by the time their appointment comes, it's too late. It is sadly too late for Gabrielle, but it is within your gift to help all the other Gabrielles by creating a legal framework through the incorporation into a Bill of Rights of the United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child, the UNCRC. A legal framework that will allow all the other Gabrielles to claim their rights to access critical services. Children with learning disabil disabilities and co-current mental health needs are living as delayed discharge patients in the ID Centre. Medically fit to leave, they remain in the children's inpatient facility for 12 to 17 year olds, sometimes for years. The concern is not only the children are detained in an unsuitable setting when they should be discharged to appropriate accommodation, but also that detention, detention may persist until they are no longer children without clear transition arrangements for them as young adults. CLC supports these children and their families to enable, leave, enable them to leave hospital and return home to live with their families or in suitable accommodation in the community. But there's a lack of appropriate accommodation throughout Northern Ireland for children who require support and management to them due to their mental health or disability. Although policies may exist, they remain aspirational and are not translated into actual action and change. This ignores the fact that the children's rights involved are absolute in nature and the absence of such action and change imposes real suffering and or long-term disadvantage. Over the years, CLC has represented a number of life-limited children and their families who cannot access the services and resources to allow their children to spend what little time they have at home living with their families. Families should not have to spend those precious hours and days locked in meetings with lawyers and duty bearers or in courtrooms in order to access services. They should be at home creating memories. But the law is inadequate in its protection of these very vulnerable children. Their voices and the voices of their parents are not heard or listened to unless legal proceedings are commenced or threatened. I know that the committee members would be supportive of the rights of these children and their families and would not wish these families to have to go through the arduous and often draining task of fighting for services through costly and protracted court hearings when they should be at home with their children. A Bill of Rights incorporating the UNCRC will provide a legislative framework to support the duty bearers who are straining to make decisions about the provision of such services. It would empower them to make those families' rights real. What the Children's Law Centre are proposing in our submission is not new or novel. The rights we are proposing for inclusion are not contested. The UK government ratified the UNCRC 30 years ago. The rights of the Convention are recognised as the minimum standards which could be agreed among nations. As a jurisdiction, we should be seeking to be standard bearers in how we care for our children. So giving legislative effect through a Bill of Rights to the minimum international standards which we have already ratified knowing they'll make a real difference to the lives of our most vulnerable children should not be a source of disagreement. 
The Children's Law Centre strongly believes that, that a Bill of Rights with clearly articulate enforceable children's rights would not only make rights real and in a timely fashion for our most vulnerable and disadvantaged children, it would free up our courts and allow much needed resources to be redirected away from adversarial legal proceedings to provide calm services in communities or support children with SEN, allowing them to access education without discrimination or to allow life-limited children to live at home with their families. I'd now like to hand over to Moinia to complete our opening statement by reflecting on the impact of COVID and the interrelationship with the Bill of Rights. We might need to bring Moinia back into broadcasting. Can you hear me now? Can I hear you now. Yeah, uh, let me just say that bit again, because it was one of thanks. It's always good to repeat thanks. So thank you very much indeed for inviting me uh, to be here. It's quite an honour to be before your committee, and it certainly is an honour to come alongside Paddy Kelly. Um, there's just a few things I want to say, but before I do, firstly, I'm not speaking on behalf of the Bar of Northern Ireland. I think it's always important to get that sort of thing out of the way. Um, secondly, the junior who assisted me in assisting um, the Children's Law Centre. His name is Nick Scott. I wouldn't like him to not be properly <laughs> represented uh, in his work. But the comments that I wanted to make, because I, I really wanted to use the response to the COVID-19 pandemic as an illustration of what it might mean if you had got children's rights enshrined in a Bill of Rights. Um, because it, I don't think anybody disagrees about the sorts of, well, I hope not, about the sorts of things that Paddy Kelly has said uh, about those rights and how one wants to vindicate them. Uh, and for that matter, the difficulty that you have in doing that when those rights are to be found in a number of different places and in order to try and maintain a level of consistency, uh, one has well, invariably has to resort uh, to going to court. And that's unfortunate and it's not what anybody wants and it's certainly not a, a, a sustainable way of approaching the vindication of rights. So if we just take uh, the response to COVID-19 as an example, um, really the children's interest, their best interest should be the, in, at the forefront of what, when you're doing anything really that affects them. I don't think anybody demurs from that, but it, I don't think it was when everybody was responding to the uh, pandemic initially by lockdown. And, and that's not because people didn't want to think about children, but it was an emergency situation and people responded to it in that way. And what is the consequence of not having factored in the particular rights and interests of children, and for that matter, their own voices, as one has to do? Um, first, we can see with education, that was a, a very easy uh, concern as to what went wrong. In, in terms of uh, children's rights. And that ultimately played its way out in a number of judicial reviews, whether it was the, their appropriate access to education and the impact of online education, the widening of the attainment gap, um, whether it was assessment of special educational needs and the provision of special educational needs, whether it was how they were to be examined and their transition from one tier of education to another, all those things ultimately were played out in the courts or were threatened to be played out in the courts. Those were all built around children's rights. And it, if they had been there and to the forefront of people's minds, uh, then it may well have been we could have had some different outcomes. Um, then if we go on and, and think about domestic abuse, people did think about domestic abuse and the impact of that on the lockdown. But I'm not sure that um, the response in relation to the children was so much in people's minds, uh, particularly children who are too young to take advantage of some of the protective means that were being built around, whether it's you contact through phone or an app or so forth. That's not uh, something that builds in a protection for children who are below the age of being capable of doing that, but not below the age of being capable of being harmed, and possibly a harm that will affect them their lifelong. So that was another element. Uh, and then if we just think about mental health services, well, people did recognize that prolonged lockdowns or successive lockdowns would have effect on mental health. But 
how much was the particular impact on children who are the, the real vulnerability of, it, of children is the fact that they very rarely can act on their own behalf. So their interests have to be acted on their behalf by others. And they're, though they're, those were children seeing the economic and health impact of those uh, that were most close to them and, and most impactful for them harm, unable to do anything about that. It's not very difficult to see how that would have its mental health impacts. And yet, were this, was there sufficient thought given as to the extra services that might be needed to address that? Uh, it's not clear that it was, or it was soon enough, but it might have been if all their rights were properly enshrined in a Bill of Rights. So that's just what I want to say is what's one example. Just when you're thinking about policy, if the rights are there enshrined, uh, they're in a Bill of Rights, then it enables this planning and it enables you to have to the forefront of, the of your mind the rights holders and bearers that you should have when you're almost doing anything that can affect them. And then just one thing I want to conclude on after that, and, and that is the way and that feeds into resources. If those rights are properly established, consistently established in a, in a Bill of Rights, then it does um, it does enable more easily the very difficult decisions that have to be made on the allocation of resources. And some of what Paddy has talked about is about the allocation of resources. The Ivy Center um, delayed discharge cases is about resources. Um, and, and, and some of that gets ultimately played out because we don't have the placement facilities or sufficient of them in Northern Ireland, tragically gets played out in uh, extra contractual referrals. And to send a child in those circumstances to another jurisdiction to look after that child because we can't give effect to its rights and care here uh, has to be regarded as a failure, frankly. Um, and then if one also looks at one final example of how it might play out in resources, uh, a mother and baby unit, there isn't one in Northern Ireland. And it's not because people don't think one is required. Of course, people do think one is required. And after an awful lot of effort, a commitment has now been given for a specialist perinatal mental health services. But it's services. It's not a mother and baby unit. And if one leaves aside the consideration for the mother at the moment and focuses on the baby right at the start of its life, what that means for that baby in, not, in there not being a mother and baby unit here is it is deprived of that bond that everybody recognizes is so important with its mother. And for an indeterminate period, really. And, and because in many cases, the mother may be suffering from postpartum depression or psychosis, is not, in a, is not able to look after that baby, but could could if helped and supported in a mother and baby unit. And that baby doesn't have that opportunity because we haven't been able to provide uh, for such a resource here. And we could have, and we could be required to provide for resource here if the resources uh, were made available in response to the rights being provided in, in a Bill of Rights, as opposed to in response to somebody having to seek legal action to try and get those rights vindicated. So I'm sure I haven't told you anything that you haven't already appreciated, but it's just the focus uh, that uh, having and those rights clearly defined for children uh, in, uh, in, a, in a Bill of Rights or some form of constitution would bring to some of those sorts of issues. Thank you. Thank you both very much um, for that sort of very expressive and strongly uh, felt and very strongly heard um, presentation to, to supplement what you had provided and written. So thanks. Thanks for that. Um, I suppose I wanted to ask, well, the first question that I want to ask is around, obviously in the presentation, you've outlined quite clearly that you'd be advocating for the CNRC to be implemented. And you've talked in the presentation around how the impacts of Brexit aren't yet fully understood. And we don't know exactly how Brexit is going to impact the North, but we know that it's not going to be good. And obviously references to the loss of the European Charter of Fundamental Rights. Um, we see just in recent days how the British government have reacted to the Scots government's um, action on the CNC CNRC and the implementation of it. Then we obviously have the review of the Human Rights Act. Is this 
given us an indication of the UK government's approach to rights, realisation of rights, codifying of rights. And does that make our own strive for a Bill of Rights for the North all the more important? Um, maybe I'll kick off and then if, if Monia wishes to come in. Um, I think there is a, a strong concern abroad uh, among those of us who advocate for children and young people uh, that for a range of right reasons, children's rights um, are at risk. You've mentioned the, uh, the Brexit issue, the review of the Human Rights Act. There is a review of uh, judicial review process, which will impact on the vindication of rights. Um, and then there is the uh, issues that, that Monia has referred to in terms of the impact of COVID and in the socioeconomic long-term impact of that and what will that have in terms of resource allocations. And I think uh, what that does, uh, and as you say, um, Chair, we are still unclear as to what the full impact of, of rights losses in terms of Brexit, Brexit would actually look like, but we're very clear there will be losses. Um, I think what it says is that there's an imperative and indeed now an urgency um, to uh, focus on ensuring that whatever plays out in relation to all of those uh, 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 coming together of forces that challenge the protection of human rights, uh, that we have put in place mechanism to ensure that rights protections for children and young people, indeed our most, most vulnerable children and young people, are actually enshrined in a way that protects against um, the, any future loss in terms of children's rights. Because uh, we would be concerned that, that while at the minute uh, the re review in terms of the Human Rights Act is um, narrow in scope, um, expressions have been made in the past by the UK government of their intention um, to look at the substantive rights in relation to the ECHR. Um, and as a previous um, uh, evidence that you heard, um, the ECHR uh, is a fundamental cornerstone of the Good Friday Agreement. So any risk or any threat to the ECHR, the Human Rights Act, again, presents serious risk to children's and young people's rights. Monia, I don't know whether you want to add anything to that. Um, well, no, just very quickly. Firstly, it's, it's always very difficult to try and second guess what another government is going to do. And I'll say no more about whether it's any more difficult to second guess what the Westminster government is going to do. I'll say no more about that. But, but actually, I'm not entirely sure that that's perhaps the right way to look at it. Because uh, I'm a great one to look at opportunity. And I think Northern Ireland has a real opportunity here to enshrine rights that um, meet with this community's values, this community circumstances, and make them Northern Ireland. Uh, yes, um, they are universal rights, and uh, most countries the world over recognising them, them as such. But to translate them into the Northern Ireland circumstance and take ownership of them here, I, I think that's a real opportunity uh, and, and, that, and, and not one that should be regarded as... Um, trying to, if you like, remedy the threats that, or avoid the threats that you face, but rather looked at from a positive point of view. Um, and and I, th I think it would be good to view it in that way. So that's what I wanted to say about Westminster. In terms of challenges, well, there's always challenges to human rights uh, because people fear they cost. And so when, when there are uh, pressures and resources are felt uh, to be... Um, to be under pressure or scant, uh, then people start thinking of, of how those resources are to be allocated and what can be saved and so on. And that's actually one of the very reasons you do want to enshrine rights because when, when people aren't in that mode, they've all recognised how important these things are. So it's a very good thing to insulate them against perhaps our worst tendencies when the, when the pressure is on. Um, so I'm, I'm not entirely sure that's helped you, but I would urge you to, to think in terms of this as a real opportunity for Northern Ireland. Thank you. I suppose, Monia, what you're talking about there, particularly in the latter part of your answer, sort of leads into what I was going to ask about next. And, and, I, and I take your point around an opportunity. 
and and this is for me this is what this is this process obviously has been ongoing for 23 years and was first talked about in 1998 and I know we've been having stakeholder events over the past couple of weeks and Mike and he'll speak for himself but Mike has said very strongly throughout all of those sessions that this is an opportunity for sort of recalibration and for us to to look for the common ground and to work together to have a bill of rights for everyone and to me that is because I, I would be of the view that we're moving into a period of constitutional change and what better way to set that up than on a rights framework and on having a basis in which everyone is sure of where they stand and that they're going to be treated as they should be um, and I suppose a lot of the a lot of the problems that you had both outlined in the earlier parts of your presentation around CAMS, mental health services for, for children and young people, addiction services, all the things that are missing, and we'll all encounter them as constituents, the MLAs, and I know I certainly do, even Senko provisions within schools, all of these things that are gaps. When you're talking about there as sort of a result of a lack of resources and people, when you talk about the pressure being on and making decisions based on a budget, a bill of rights, to my mind, there acts as your insulation, your security, your accountability mechanism. I keep using the term the thing that makes people do the right thing and puts the the focus on delivering for people. So I don't know if you have any other comments on that, but um, just to thank you again, and, and I'll pass to to make after this. Well, just on that, I absolutely agree with you. <laughs> Thanks. Patty, was there anything else that you wanted to say? No, I agree with both of you. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> sure, that's it. That's it done. Then. <laughs> we'll go to the vice chair now, Mike. Chair, thank you very much, and, and I agree with just about everything <laughs> except the constitutional change piece, obviously. <laughs> But I think it is an opportunity to recalibrate and you know to think about. Uh, we had a presentation uh, earlier this afternoon on gender budgeting, and I think that that's a way we can look differently at how we deliver government. Uh, I'm thinking about our young people and what the sort of society we're going to help them create is a new way and a better way of looking at how we, we deliver government. So, Monia and Kelly and Patty, I'm not going to. Um, go into the detail of this because I, I don't see areas of disagreement. What I'm interested in is how we make young people aware of what we do if we get over the line with this Bill of Rights. And yesterday I was talking about there's a programme uh, in our GCSE uh, curriculum called Learning for Life and Work, which has a section about local and global citizenship. Is that the sort of area where we, we make young people aware, or should we be doing it actually a lot earlier in our primary schools? I just welcome your thoughts. Um, maybe I'll kick off, Monia, and, and uh, uh, if you want to come in then, maybe reflect on our experience, Mike. Um, I suppose where we're coming from, Mike, is that if children and young people don't know they have rights, then they can't claim them. So I totally agree with you. It is imperative um, that children and young people know what rights they have and also how they can claim them. So we have spent, we have explored many ways in terms of raising awareness among children and young people. Um, I think it should start in, in primary school um, and continue into, obviously into post-primary school. Um, we also need to take uh, account of children and young people who are not in school, you know, who are, I talked about children who are in hospital, uh, children who are in uh, AOTIS provision, uh, children who are in the juvenile justice centre. Um, and uh, we, need to, we need to make provision uh, in relation to how we make them aware of their rights. Um, the important thing about it is to ask young people. Um, you need to ask young people, how, what's the best way um, to make you and your peers aware of their rights. Um, and they will tell you. We had an experience of this very recently um, where young people told us when we were compiling the last report to the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child for submission to the committee. And they told us they didn't know about their rights and they didn't know how to claim their rights. So then we asked them, well, how should they do it? And their answer came back very loud and very clear online, 
young people live their lives on their phones. They live them online. Um, and if you want to reach children and young people, that's where you have to go. You have to go where they are. So in response, what the Children's Law Centre did was uh, we worked and co-designed with children and young people um, a chatbot, which I refer to in, in my presentation, called RE. And what READ does, it gives children and young people information about their lives, where they are, when they need it. So it could be 12 o'clock at night in Strabane or, you know, three o'clock on a, a Sunday afternoon in Port of Ferry. But they can get it, you know, when the Children's Law Centre are closed. And then what it does, it'll direct them to us through live chat to actually you know, get information if they have a particular issue in relation to that. So, yes, we have done it through schools in the past. We've done it through leaflets in the past. Um, and I suppose we did that because that's what young people told us to do then. What they're telling us now is to do it online. That will change again. The best way is when, not if, but when we get the best possible Bill of Rights, which protect children and young people's rights, is to say to them, how do we make young people aware of those rights? Um, I think that's such a great question, Mike, if you don't mind me saying so. It's, it sounds a bit condescending to say it, but it's not meant like that. It's a great question. Um, I'm. I, this is just my personal view. Um, I'm sort of really not in favour of having these things taught in school as a subject, if you like, although there's no harm in teaching the evolution of, of rights as a subject and, and the different rights that, uh, that apply in, in different countries of the world. That's fine as a subject. But that's not really what I, I take it that you're talking about. And what is really at issue is... Yeah, children under, because the corollary to rights is uh, responsibility. So what you're really trying to teach is not just that their rights, but their rights, but what it means to live in the society. And that's actually what you're trying to build by, by the, um, the, the Bill of Rights that you're talking about. What sort of society will you have? So that's something that should start just as early as you possibly can. Be, be, the, for two reasons. One, because it's it's more than just their individual rights, which you want them to vindicate. It's all it's going to be about how they behave in society and how they expect other people to behave. And then I, ultimately about what they take responsibility for and what they expect other people to take responsibility for. And as you engage in this way with them, and I think I think it is about engagement and not just teaching in, in a sort of um, a one dimensional or asymmetrical kind of way. As you engage in that, what you're really really doing is you are looking at the face of your society in the future because that's who these young people are going to be and and what what you're inculcating there will tell you how your society will look in the future and once one sort of really takes on board the significance of that then you can't start too soon to start to help people understand. And it's not just their rights. Other people have rights too, and they have responsibilities. So I think it's a much broader question than the individual rights that will be enshrined in a Bill of Rights, although, of course, they, they need to know that for all the reasons that Paddy has talked about. Yeah, I, I suppose to two points, if I may, Monia, um, arising from that. And, and you mentioned responsibilities as well as rights. And yeah, and, I mean, we, 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 we talk about a preamble to the Bill of Rights and, and I think largely one of the criticisms is uh, that it's only aspirational. Uh, and what we really need are, are concrete, substantive rights. I would see the, the, the preamble being maybe more inspirational in terms of this is the sort of society uh, that we want to create. This is the vision of our society. And these are the values that will underpin everything we do. So that would be the, the first thing. The second would be, yeah, I, I do want to know if, if you're, you know, five or six or seven years of age and something happens to you that you do know this shouldn't be happening to me. Absolutely. And this is what I, this is my pathway to doing something about it. And as Paddy says, certainly in the current generation, it's on your smartphone that you, you start a process of saying, red flagging this. But the first thing is that you have to know that's what happening, what is happening to you shouldn't be happening to you. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it, 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 uh, a 15-year-old was able to work out that what was happening in terms of environmental uh, crisis should not be happening. A 15-year-old worked that out. Uh, but she shouldn't have had to work it out. It should have been, her pathway should have been clear as to what to do about that as opposed to camping outside her school every Friday. Um, but uh, in terms of the, the preamble points you make, well, I mean, 
I, I will leave it to others to how the thi how these things are actually designed and what goes in. But but if you ask me my view, is it good to have something inspirational? Well, of course it is. And I gave a presentation about I think it was a couple of months ago um, when I read out and it's, I'm ashamed to say I hadn't done it for a long time. I read out the uh, preamble to the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And it's an extraordinary piece of faith in the future and faith in, in, in humankind. It is inspirational just to read it. So there's nothing wrong with having an inspirational piece. But you must have something else as well. It can't all be inspiration. There has to be something. And I, I know you don't mean it to be that. But there have to be real rights. And as Paddy says, you have to be able to know how to vindicate those. Yeah, I, I, I think in my current thinking, I'm thinking of like the, the traditional five Ws. The who, what, when, where, and why. The why is the preamble. Everything else is, is the concrete substantive uh, rights in part to part two, as it were. But isn't it? It's been most interesting listening to to both of you. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Okay, I think we have Paula. Um, thank you, Chair. Thank you, ladies, for coming today. I, I suppose my question is maybe to yourself, Paddy, and it's really in relation to the work that went on in Scotland to um, incorporate the UN, UNCRC into domestic law there. Obviously, it's only come into effect um, in March, so I suppose the actual impact um, is one thing that still has to be measured. But, you know, the process that they went through, I'm just wondering, do you have any engagement with any of your counterparts in Scotland as part of that process and how difficult or easy did they find it in terms of um, just the, that sort of incorporation and assimilation into to domestic law? Thank you. Um, thank you for the question, Paula. Yes, I would work very closely. There are uh, an, a grouping of across all four jurisdictions of organisations, similar organisations, uh, and we would come together to um, to work together around the UNCRC and how we can actually promote and, and uh, further the protection of children's rights. So yes, I think we have a lot to learn from from what happened in Scotland. Um, I am uh, I, I think we are uh, well. I'm very jealous of, of what they've achieved, um, uh, but I think that we can do the same. Um, and I think, as, as Monia says, we have the opportunity now um, through the Bill of Rights to incorporate the UNCRC Convention into um, our, our domestic legislation and give it full effect. Um, I think colleagues there built very strong relationships um, across sectors, across uh, the voluntary sector, uh, worked very closely with the Children's Commissioner in Scotland, and I know they worked very, very closely uh, with uh, members of the Scottish Assembly. Um, uh, and they also ensured the voices of children and young people were actually heard in the process. Um, and I think I'd like to congratulate uh, on the record um, the work that they have undertaken in relation to this. Um, so they have led the way. Uh, but I think we can catch up with them um, and ensure that we have equivalency protection between uh, both jurisdictions uh, in the near future. Um, thank you. I, I, I suppose just following on in, um, in terms of Moynihan, in terms of the actual role or the ability for children to have a voice in our local uh, legal system here um, through the Bill of Rights, you know, in terms of when they're actually trying to realise their rights, you know, how would you see that actually manifesting itself or you know how, how can we ensure that they that it is meaningful and that they it's not a just a tokenism um going forward whenever they're actually feel that their rights are not being um uh, they can't avail of them um it's, it's a complex question because it because if you deal with children across the spectrum, you have children whose rights are being infringed, who are too, almost too young to know that they are. And even that, and that would be even with the best education, they, they just are. Um, and then you have children who, who have such a disability that they're not able to take independent action to, to vindicate their rights. And I think Paddy has spoken um, very strongly about the most vulnerable of the most vulnerable. Children are a vulnerable category anyway, it's well known. But within that category, there are some very, very vulnerable children. So how they have a voice is going to be through those who, are, uh, who have care of them uh, and, and should uh, be vindicating their rights. And if you 
pass the sort of uh, bill of rights that Paddy is advocating will have the means to do that. Uh, in, in terms of older children, how do they vindicate their rights? Well, once they are alert to what they are, um, then, you, then uh, there are all sorts of agencies that they can go to to help them do that if they have to do it through the courts. It would be very preferable if they didn't have to do it to, through the courts, frankly, because that can be a very blunt instrument as well as a time-consuming one, and for some, quite traumatic, as, as, as well as being entirely unpredictable what the outcome would be. So that's, I mean, when, when one talks about vindicating of rights, I, I'd be, I mean, although I'm a lawyer myself, and that's my career, but I'd be very help, happy from the point of view of children not to be so busy in that area, uh, because they didn't really need to do that. And I actually think that's what you've asked is a very important question, is what are the other means by which children can express the concerns that they have, which don't require them to have to engage in the full panoply of, uh, of uh, the law and the enforcement of those rights in those ways. And that's something worth considering. Um, what are the forums that could be created alongside uh, what you're doing that could, that could allow them to have a voice? And, and for those who don't necessarily recognize the extent to which their rights are being infringed, to allow them to take avoiding action before the pre-action protocol level to turns up, you know. So I think it actually is worth thinking about that. I mean, my view is that, I mean, in terms of resources, anything that you can do that makes more predictable the response to something happening and also less opportunity for it to have to be de dealt with through the court is probably a cheaper, uh, a cheaper uh, alternative. And, and, and may well be more satisfying. So it is actually worth thinking about what those means could be, I'm not in a position to start drafting on the hoof, but I think it is something well worth thinking about and not just thinking about the vindication of rights through starting uh, legal challenges. Um, thank you. And just, just to follow on a bit, I suppose I would be concerned that not only does the child maybe not have the capacity to recognise that the rights are being infringed, but also the, the parent maybe in terms of their educational um, attainment, or, or maybe they've just got a lot of children or they've so many caring responsibilities that don't even have time to lift their head and think about it. So I suppose it's about not just the rights of the child and the child um, acting upon, it's also about the parent actually recognising and getting the support to actually support well, Paulie, Paulie, you're, Paulie, you're right, because, I mean, where will this start? It was the fact that in, in, invariably a child vindicates their rights if they're going to have to do it in that way through an adult in some way, because that's that's just the way the way that it works. And and much as much as you need to educate children about their rights, not all adults know about their rights either or, for that matter, know the rights that their children might have. Uh, so that's the, so there is an education across the board, and in fact, it, it, it part I presume part of the process of getting your bill of rights uh, uh, up and running and enforceable will be a greater engagement, and will be that people more uh, are more focused on what these things are and 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 ha the means to vindicate them. But you're right about that. It's not just the children who have to see a part recognize their rights and a pathway through to vindicating them. It is those that they rely on have to have to do that as well. And could I just add to that as well, Paula? I think that is, brings us right back to the importance of the Bill of Rights because the Bill of Rights is there and you have a strong framework that enables the decision makers and those who allocate resources to make the, the best possible decisions uh, in the best interest of the children. Then those parents, many of them are vulnerable, and we see this in our work, many of those parents are vulnerable as well or do not have the educational opportunities um, or the capacity or are at their wit's end and exhausted um, to do that. But if you have a strong Bill of Rights, then they will not have to go through that process where they will actually have to resort to the, co the, the draining and costly litigation to actually allow their children to access critical services. Thank you, both ladies. No, I, I totally agree with that, and I suppose it comes back to running things through all of our um, Bill of Rights meetings, and that's about how we have to use this for pre-legislative scrutiny tool so that you know we can get it d downstream before, before we have that um, sort of very laborious um, process at the far end. But thanks very much. Thank you. Okay. Paula, we have Carl looking to ask a question. Um, thank you very much. Um, really, really interesting, fascinating stuff. Um, um, but <clears throat> the issue for me is that we have Section 75, okay, at the minute. 
And Paddy, you use Gabrielle's example at the start. And um, and unfortunately, she's not going to be on her own. There are many, many youngsters who are going through emergency department uh, and who can't be treated unless they sober up. Well, if they're an addict, that's easier said than done. So, um, and Orlea Flynn and I have been dealing with this issue with very young children or very young adolescents and regrettably their parents as well. So I don't know how we're going to deal with that. And I do believe the investment in mental health is one way, but I also believe that there needs to be a realisation that these people are being failed and they don't know they're being failed. So there's an example of people who don't realise they have the same right as someone who hobbled them with a broken ankle, but because it's mental health, they're not treated seriously. But the other issue for me is how could we protect through a Bill of Rights the rights of the people, particularly, particularly children, um, given the fact that, you know, like if you look at health, there was no quality impact assessment done on the health budget, but yet in all there was four major concerns identified as having a quality impacts potentially. Children, those with disability, gender and age, okay? So um, it's that, and I'll also mention the crisis in housing. So we still have Section 75, we've got ECHR as well, um, but yet and all people have been discriminated against and their children and their families on the basis that they can't get a home to live in because there was political disagreement on homes being built in the first place. How are we going to get around stuff like that? Will the Bill of Rights put an end to that, um, in your opinion? Or is it... If it's a trend and stronger legislation, that you can go to court and challenge it stronger. Um, because while I accept we absolutely need a single equality act, we absolutely need stronger human rights legislation and the Bill of Rights. Um, how are we going to protect people who can't really stand up for themselves? Okay, well... Will I go first, Monia, or, or are you happy with that? Yeah. Um, uh, I, I agree with you, Carol, that uh, it is a tsunami, the mental health issues and the associated alcohol and addiction problems that are facing our, our young people. Um, and we need to find that framework that will actually give their rights um, better protection and, and allow them to be vindicated. Um, it would be the Children's Law Centre view that Section 75 has failed to deliver inequality or equality of opportunity. Um, and that then speaks to uh, the point that Les made in the previous presentation that we need a strong freestanding equality provision uh, in a Bill of Rights um, that, that is enforceable. Um, we would also say if you look at the UNCRC, for example, in relation to the mental health issue, if we incorporate Article 24, uh, which recognises the right of the child to the enjoyment of the highest attainable standards of health, uh, and to facilitate the treatment of illness and rehabilitation of health uh, and strive to ensure that no child is deprived of his or her right to access to such health care services. That gives a very strong, I mean, there are additional uh, provisions in that article, which I'm not going to read out, but that gives a very strong right, which should be um, enforceable by children and young people and their families to ensure their right to access not just health in relation to the broken leg, but rights in relation to their access to CAMS and to addiction services. Uh, and similarly, in Article 27 of the Convention, um, it, it would provide for provision in terms of uh, accommodation and a, a standard of living uh, uh, in relation to adequate to a child's physical, mental, spiritual, moral and social development. And I think, again, that gives a strong, because I mean, we do, we have we have cases coming through in terms of homeless, ch homeless children and the statistics, as you all well know, are frightening in relation to homelessness among children and young people, uh, both living independently or, or, on their, or with their families. Again, we would say that the incorporation of that would give a strong framework, which hopefully will not lead to people, because you're right, these people are very, and children are very vulnerable. It would lead to a situation where they wouldn't have to vindicate their rights. But when people like yourselves and ministers and civil servants are making decisions in terms of legislation or policy, they will have to take cognizance and comply with the provisions uh, that have been incorporated and ensure that the facilities, the mental health provision and the associated spend 
will meet the needs of the children and young people living in the most disadvantaged communities. Yeah, I'd just like to sort of pick up there where Paddy's left off, which is what you would really be doing by a Bill of Rights that enshrine the kind of rights that we've been discussing this afternoon and that you've been discussing on other occasions is, um, firstly, you're making it clearer to the decision makers what the parameters are and what they have to do. Uh, and it's not always entirely clear because those rights are not always to be found conveniently expressed in whatever piece of legislation or regulation it is for the particular area you're dealing with. So we make clear to them. Uh, and if, if those rights are being um, infringed, then it, that's very clear. And it's, it's easier to, you, to use that vernacular, hold their feet to the fire about that, because it's much easier for those who are seeking to advocate their rights, or they themselves, if they're old enough uh, uh, to see it and able to do it. Um, but one of the things I think perhaps hasn't been mentioned, but maybe it's because it's a subtext, and that is that you, you really don't want to keep going to court every time. You don't want to be reinventing a wheel as to a particular right and that it has, in these particular circumstances, been infringed. That is not a way that a society ought to go about dealing with the human rights uh, uh, in its jurisdiction. Um, and what would happen, I think, although... You know, I hesitate to speculate about the future. But if you had a strong and clear Bill of Rights, you would enable the jurisprudence, the, the judgments that develop around the decision making of that to enable those rights to develop in some sort of consistent manner that can be relied on and people can now appreciate that is the appropriate interpretation of that particular right. As opposed to, you see now, and it just if you just took in, in, in the field of uh, almost any of the ones we've mentioned, whether it's education, whether it's health, whether it's youth justice, the numbers of cases that are being brought on an individual level to, to, uh, for individual circumstances. It's a hugely wasteful and destructive way, destructive way of going about treating vulnerable people who are only coming to court because something's gone wrong in the first place. Uh, it's, it's really not a good way to deal with it. And so you hope to reduce the incidence of going to court. Rights are always infringed, I'm afraid. That's just the fact of the matter. But what you hope to do is to reduce the incidence of it and produce good jurisprudence around it so that people understand and as time goes on, what the outworkings of these rights mean. You know, so the next time that a young person comes and complains that they've been put in a bed and breakfast place is wholly unsuitable for them. We don't have to start thinking in terms of going off to court on their behalf. We, we can see already from a provision in, in, the, in the Bill of Rights that that is an infringement of their rights, and you hope to, to, to stop the, the, the conduct then and there. And if not, it becomes quite clear how you would go to court and what basis you would be going to court on. Uh, so, I mean, I, I think it's not to be underestimated the impact it would have on the development of learning around the Bill of Rights. And we have seen that on even on the, the, the UN um, conventions. We have seen the learning that's been developed and how that has evolved to meet the needs of the, of the time, which goes to something somebody said earlier in their evidence about how do you make sure that you sort of future-proofed it. Um, that, that's that's, that's part of it. You're, you see the evolution of that as, as it's, uh, it matches the vindication of rights to suit the development of the time. No, I, I appreciate that. But, you know, people have had to go to court because of political decisions that people are making. And they're making those decisions not based on equality or human rights indications. They're making them because they can and the associated budgets with mental health, you're right, Paddy, they should be there, but they're not, and that's a political decision. So, um, and you have seen, we have we have seen that where ministers take responsibility for their own department and their own department's budget and prioritise those budgets paralleled against rights and outcomes, then that's, that's the reasons why you shouldn't need to go to court. But unfortunately, that doesn't happen across the board. And what I'm trying to get at is having a Bill of Rights is really important because Section 75 is failing and has failed. And you only have to look at the housing crisis in North Belfast or the mental health crisis right across 
the whole of the north, but particularly in north and west Belfast. Um, and it's areas that have suffered um, from systemic inequality and uh, poverty and deprivation that are going to see the worst outcomes of political decisions that actually, when you put it down on paper, are a denial of rights. So we, we want the strongest possible Bill of Rights, but I'm not convinced everybody else does. And that's the problem that we have. That is the problem. We have people who say the right things, um, but they'll be tested and their vernacular feet to the fire will be held um, to the fire um, because we've been through a year of talking to children and young people and people who've had their rights denied. Um, we're talking about people from LGBTQ+, older people, people with disabilities, um, what some of us call our most vulnerable. Um, so we all need to stand over what we said to them. So if we don't get a Bill of Rights, then there needs to be a big, big discussion about why not, in my opinion. Because if not, we'll all end up in court. And that's what happens. And there's enough jurisprudence here about the denial of rights, you know, to cover Europe and then some. But unfortunately, that's the position that we're in. Thanks, Carol. Um, I don't know, Manya or Patty, if you are coming back or if that's... No, that's fine. Okay, okay. Um, I don't think any other members have indicated. So I think at this point we can thank you both um, again for your time and for, I mean that was a lengthy discussion and a very interesting presentation and very interesting answers and, and conversation between all the members and yourselves so thank you so much for taking the time to join us this afternoon and we will let you go on with the rest of your day and let you drop off the call thank you thank you thank very you much for much. having us thank you very much chair and can I wish you well and uh, I hope and trust that you will uh, ensure that children and young people do enjoy the protection that they actually need and deserve Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, members. We can now move on with the rest of our meeting pack. So we just have... I'll wait for everyone to be brought back into the spotlight. Okay, everyone's here. So we just, um, item number five of our agenda today, Chairperson's Business, and we just have one item. We have a report from the informal meeting that we had last week with the representatives from the British Supreme Court. Um, so if members are content to note that. Content. Yeah, happy days. Um, item number six, the draft minutes for our last meeting on the 15th of April. You'll find that on page 116 of your pack. Again, everyone can get, I see thumbs up, good stuff. Number seven, matters arising. We don't have any matters arising this afternoon. Um, number eight is correspondence. And members, you'll find uh, a couple of uh, items of correspondence. There's a letter there from Dermot Nesbitt and another one from Chris McCrudden. Is everyone happy to note that? Happy days. So then the next and final item is our forward work program. If you can... Uh, refer to your draft forward work program on page 133 of the meeting pack and members will be aware that next week is the last evidence session and if people are content to note that yeah so ahead of uh, the date and time place of next meeting if anyone has any other business I just want to take this opportunity to remind members that we have the informal meeting tomorrow morning at 11 o'clock with the Erectus Committee and the implementation of the Good Friday Agreement. So if um, members are available, I'll see Mike has put his thumbs up. So happy days. Our next meeting then after the informal session tomorrow is next Thursday, same time, same place. Thank you all. And we will say fan there. All right. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29.